Alhamdulillah, Allah has given us the tawfiq to meet once again and share some brief reflections on Surah An-Najm. We reached ayah number 33, and inshallah, I hope to, to cover verses 33 to potentially verse uh, 40, inshallah, tonight. So let me look at the few, let's look at the first few verses where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, have you seen the one who turned away, gave little and then withheld? Does he have knowledge of the unseen such that he sees? Or has he not been informed of that which is in the scriptures of Moses and Abraham who fulfilled? That none shall bear the burden of another. So these are verses 33 to 38, inshallah. After we discuss them, we'll move on to the next uh, section. Now, the question that naturally arises when Allah says, tawalla, Have you seen the one who turned away? Now, the question is, who is who, who are these verses speaking about? The majority of the Mufassireen believe that these verses were revealed about an individual by the name of Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira. Now, who is Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira? Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira was a Meccan. He was from the tribe of Quraysh, and he was living in Mecca during the early days of Islam. And he was prominent, a very prominent individual in Meccan society. He was among the very few literate Arabs. So he was able to write and read, and he was known for his eloquence. He was an astounding, he was an excellent poet. So Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira is a very influential person in Meccan society. Now, when he hears that the Holy Prophet is inviting people to this new faith, he's naturally curious. So he decides to meet the Prophet ﷺ, and he listens to some verses of the Qur'an. Specifically, he listens to a few verses from Surah Ghafir. Now after listening to these verses, he's dumbfounded, he's bewildered, to such an extent that when he goes back to his tribe and his companions, they ask him about his opinion of the Qur'an because they were hoping that Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira would be able to produce literature that would rival the Qur'an. So everyone is anxiously waiting to hear what the opinion of Walid is about the Qur'an. Now historians have noted the following testimony. This is Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira's reaction to hearing a few verses of the Qur'an. After hearing the first three verses of Surah Ghafir, Walid ibn al-Mughira, he says, Wallah laqad sami'tu min Muhammadin anifan kalaman ma huwa min kalam al-ins wala min kalam al-jinn. He says that I have just heard the words of Muhammad. And I swear by God that these are not the words of a human being, nor are they the words of jinn. Walid, he says, that there is a sweetness to the words that I heard. There is something very magnetic about them. There is an elegance to the words that I have heard. He begins to describe the Qur'an as a tree. He says that the high points of this book, meaning he gives this imagery of a tree that it's, it bears fruits. And it has water running on the ground. What he means to say is that it's so bountiful in what it offers. It's not only eloquent, but it offers wisdom. It's, it's only a few verses, but it's compact 
with meaning, with knowledge, with guidance. وَإِنَّهُ يَعْلُوا وَلَا يُعْلَى عَلَيْهِ And he says that this is a speech that surpasses and cannot be surpassed. Now, when Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira makes this statement, you can imagine the reaction of some of the aristocrats of Mecca. They're, they're naturally worried because if, if Walid becomes Muslim, it will strengthen the ranks of the Muslims. That Islam will be strengthened if someone like Walid joins them. So some of his companions, they say to him, some of his relatives, they say, they start to ridicule him. They start to threaten him. And they offer him, they make the following offer to him. They say, Tarakta ma kana alayhi kubara'ana. They try to guilt trip him. They invoke, you know, his ancestors. They say that, are you trying to say that our elders, our forefathers were astray? Tarakta ma kana alayhi kubara'ana. You're abandoning our culture. You're abandoning the tradition of our forefathers. You now consider them to be misguided. Are you trying to say that your father, your grandfather, all of our ancestors are going to hell and they're all misguided and you're not, you now believe that this Quran is the word of God? So Walid says to them, so this is a conversation that's happening between him and his relatives. He says, Inni akhafu min that I fear the punishment of God. I heard words that were above the ability of human beings, that are divine. So one of his relatives says to him, In a'ataytani shay'an min malik wa raja'ta ila shirk It seems that Walid was so inclined towards Islam that he was, he was about to become Muslim. So one of his relatives says to him, that why don't you pay charity? Because even the Arabs value charity. They understood the virtue of charity. He says, why don't you give some charity? And why don't you give me some charity and come back to our polytheistic tradition? And I, why don't you come back to the polytheistic tradition, pay this charity, and I will carry the burden of your sins. If it turns out that you are misguided, I will be accountable before God on the day of judgment, meaning I will carry the burden on my neck. So Walid was inclined to accept Islam. Someone from among his relatives makes this offer to him that pay charity to me and I will bear the burden of your sins. Allah Azza wa Jal reveals these verses. Have you seen the one who turned away? He was almost about to submit. He was almost about to embrace Islam. You see brothers and sisters, the danger of having sinful friends, wicked companions. You might be on the brink of guidance, but because of your, your associates, because of the people that you hang around with, because of your friends, they might pull you away. <inaudible> so Walid gives him money, but he doesn't give him as much as, as he had promised. So Walid agrees that I'll give you this charity, but he ends up not giving him the full amount that he had promised. And this is why Allah says, وَأَعْطَى قَلِيلًا He gave little and then withheld. أَعِنْدَهُ عِلْمُ الْغَيْبِ فَهُوَ يَرَى Does he have knowledge of the unseen? For someone to have this belief that someone else will bear the burden of my sins, to speak with such confidence and authority about matters relating to the hereafter, Allah is asking, do you have ilmul ghaib for you to have such a belief that someone else 
will bear the burden of your iniquities. And this shows us, brothers and sisters, that we cannot speak about matters relating to the hereafter without knowledge of the unseen. The only ones who are qualified to tell us about what happens in the grave or what happens in Barzakh or what will happen on the Day of Judgment are those who have been endowed with Ilmul Ghayb. So Allah criticizes these individuals saying that you have Ilmul Ghayb because having knowledge of the unseen is one of the prerequisites to speaking in detail and with authority about matters relating to the hereafter. And then Allah Azza wa Jal in ayah number 36, He says, أَمْ لَمْ يُنَبَّأْ بِمَا فِي صُحْفِ مُوسَى وَإِبْرَاهِيمَ الَّذِي وَفَّى Or has he not been informed of that which is in the scriptures of Moses and Abraham who fulfilled now, in these verses, Musa السلام, is mentioned before Ibrahim. Allah mentions the scriptures of Musa, before the scrolls of Musa, before the scriptures of Ibrahim. Now, chronologically, as you know, Ibrahim السلام, came before Musa. Ibrahim is his predecessor and Musa السلام, came a long time after Ibrahim but here Musa is mentioned before Ibrahim and some of the Mufassireen they believe that the scripture the scrolls of Musa are mentioned before Ibrahim because they were more widely known and we still have the scrolls of Musa whereas the scriptures of Ibrahim السلام, have been lost. Now, we all were familiar with the fact that Allah Azza wa Jal revealed the Torah to Musa. السلام. But here it seems that Ibrahim السلام, was also a recipient of revelation. Because when we think about books of revelation, when we think about divine scriptures, we usually think about what comes to mind typically is Injil, the Gospel, Tawrat of Musa, the Quran, and maybe the Zabur, the Psalms of David. But Allah Azza wa Jal revealed many scriptures to the ancient prophets. We have a hadith that Abu Dhar had a conversation with the Holy Prophet. And this is an excerpt from a very lengthy discussion between Abu Dhar and the Holy Prophet. It's known as the Wasiyah of Rasulullah to Abu Dhar. It's been translated in the English language and it's full of spiritual advice that the Holy Prophet gave to Abu Dhar. Abu Dhar, Radhwanullahi alayhi, he asks the Holy Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, Kam Adadul Anbiya. How many prophets have been sent to humanity? The Holy Prophet he says, Allah has sent 124,000 prophets. Abu Dhar then asks, Ya Rasulullah, how many messengers have been sent? You see, even Abu Dhar understands that there is a distinction, there is a difference between Anbiya and Mursaleen. That Nabi is one thing and Rasul is another. How many messengers has Allah sent? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi says that Allah has sent 313 messengers. Now, of course, five of them are the messengers of great resolve. Nuh, Ibra Nuh, Ibrahim, Musa, Isa, and the Holy Prophet. These are the messengers of great resolve. But there are other messengers, 313 of them. And then Abu Dhar, he asks the Prophet, 
He says, Ya Rasulullah, kam anzal Allahu min kitab? How many scriptures has Allah revealed? How many books, how many books of revelation has He revealed? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, Allah has revealed 104 books, 104 scriptures, many of them. And then he shares with us who were the recipients of these books. So the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, Anzalallahu minha ala Adam ashar suhuf. Allah revealed 10 scriptures, 10 books to Adam. So Adam السلام, was a recipient of revelation in the form of scriptures. وَعَلَى شِيثٍ خَمْسِينَ صَحِيفًا Adam السلام, had a grandson who was also a prophet named Sheath. Sheath received 50 scriptures. Khamsina Sahifa. And Sahifa is the singular of Suhuf. You know, we have Sahifa Sajjadiya. Sahifa literally in the Arabic language means something that is spacious. And then the Arabs used it to refer to anything that they would write on because there would be enough room for them to inscribe or write. So Adam received 10 scriptures. Sheath received 50. وَعَلَىٰ Idris 30 Sahifa. Idris السلام, received 30 scriptures. Now Idris predates Ibrahim السلام. وَعَلَىٰ Ibrahim عَشَرْ صَحَائِفِ Allah Azza wa Jal revealed 10 scriptures to Ibrahim. وَالتَّوْرَاتِ Allah revealed the Torah to Musa. وَالْإِنْجِيلِ He revealed the Gospel, Injil, to Isa alayhi salam. وَالزَّبُورِ Allah revealed the Psalms to Dawood. Wal Furqan, and then of course the holy the uh, the holy Quran was revealed to the holy prophet. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to refute this idea that someone is able to bear your sins on the day of judgment, and you can just pay your way out of Jahannam. Allah mentions what was written in the scriptures of Musa and Ibrahim, meaning what is being mentioned here is in the Quran, but it was also mentioned in previous revelations. Has he not been informed of that which is in the scriptures of Musa? Now Ibrahim السلام, is described as the one who fulfilled and Ibrahim who fulfilled. Now what does it mean when Allah says Ibrahim fulfilled? If you look at the Quran brothers and sisters there is no prophet other than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi who is given more difficult trials than Ibrahim السلام, The trials and the tribulations that Ibrahim experienced were more severe than any prophet other than our prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Allah Azza wa Jal in Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 124, he says, بِكَلِمَاتٍ فَأَتَمَّهُنْ that Allah tried Ibrahim with some words, the kalimat, meaning some trials, some tests. فأتمهن, and he fulfilled, he completed these trials. He passed these divine tests. قَالَ إِنِّي جَاعِلُكَ لِلنَّاسِ Then Allah Azza wa Jal promoted him to the rank of 
Imam. So what did he fulfill? The Mufassirin, they say the meaning of Ibrahim al-Ladhi waffa annahu badala nafsahu lil-niran wa qalbahu lil-Rahman wa waladahu lil-Qurban wa maalahu lil-Ikhwan that Ibrahim alayhi salam he gave himself to the fire so one of the first trial that is mentioned is that he grew up in a polytheistic society a society that worshipped idols he spoke out against idol worship and his community decided to burn him alive they catapulted him catapulted him into the the fire now the ahadith mention that he was so and by the way brothers and sisters Ibrahim was very young when they threw him in the fire I don't want you to think that Ibrahim is an elderly man or he's a middle-aged man he was a youth they threw him into the fire because when the mushrikeen of Babylon when they left the city to go participate in their festival Ibrahim destroyed their idols and when they came back and they found that their idols were destroyed someone they asked who did this to our idols and someone said a youth named Ibrahim so he was young so they prepare this inferno for him they get a catapult and they throw him in the fire look at Ibrahim's devotion to Allah Look at his trust in Allah even at a young age. When he's airborne, he's in the air and he's about to collapse and fall into the fire. Jibrail appears and says, Ya Ibrahim, alaka haja. Do you have any need? Do you have any request? Ibrahim alayhi salam, he says, Amma ilayka fala. Ibrahim is not arrogant. He doesn't deny that he's in need. But he says to Jibrail, I am in need, but I don't need you. I have a haja, but I, I'm not going to ask you. So then Ibrahim is told by the malaika, why don't you ask Allah? Ask Allah to save you from the flames. And this is happening in a matter of seconds as he's descending into the fire. And then he says, that I don't even need to articulate my haja because his knowledge, meaning God's knowledge of my condition suffices. I don't need to ask. He knows best. So he was, he, he had great resolve in the face of this trial. He was willing to sacrifice himself. When he was given a son, he was given a son at a very old age. Now you can imagine how dear Ismail was to Ibrahim. And Allah tested Ibrahim with his son Ismail on two occasions, at, the, at least that we know of. The first was shortly after Ismail is born. Can you imagine how attached Ibrahim was to his son? He's in his 90s maybe, and he has this newborn son. He was praying for many years to have a son. Allah gave him a son. And then Allah commands him to take Hajar and Ismail to Mecca, to a barren desert, and leave them there, and you go back. That's why in the Quran, what does he say? He leaves his wife and his newborn son, his infant son, and he says, رَبَّنَا إِنِّي أَسْكَنْتُ مِنْ ذُرِّيَّةِ بِوَادٍ غَيْرِ ذِي زَرْعٍ عِنْدَ بَيْتِكَ الْمُحَرَّةِ that, oh my Lord, oh our Lord, 
I am leaving a part of my progeny in this barren land, in this valley that is void of any vegetation. There's nothing there. There's no tree. There are no trees, no plants, no water. But he fulfills it. He doesn't let his emotions. He doesn't allow his emotions to prevent him from discharging his duty. And then he sees the dream where he sacrifices Ismail and he's willing to fulfill that. And then trial after trial, he passes all of these trials until he reaches the level of being Khalilullah. When Rasulullah sallallahu was asked how Ibrahim السلام, reached the rank of being the intimate friend of God, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi says, Mattakhada Allahu Ibrahim khalilan illa li it'amihi at'am wa ifsha'ihi salam wa salatihi bil layl wa nasu niyam. Rasulullah mentions three qualities of Ibrahim that allowed him to earn the honor of being the intimate friend of God. The first is Ibrahim used to feed the poor. He had a habit. He would always be concerned about the less fortunate. There is no way, brothers and sisters, that you will achieve nearness to Allah unless you care about other people, unless you're concerned about the less fortunate, unless you make an effort to look after those who are in need. Ibrahim used to give, he used to feed the poor. He used to spread peace. He would greet people. If he would see people fighting amongst each other, he would reconcile their differences. He would spread peace. You know, many of us, we claim to love Ibrahim. We call ourselves Muslims, and Ibrahim was the one who coined the term Muslim, but we spread fitna in our communities. We're not like Ibrahim. We don't spread peace. We don't reconcile people's... When, when people are in conflict, we don't try to reconcile conflict. وَصَلَاتِهِ بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّاسُ نِيَامِ And number three, Rasulullah says, because he used to spend a part of the night praying. While people were while, while when people were asleep, so Allah Azza wa Jal, going back to the ayah, He says, "Has He not been informed of that which is in the scriptures of Musa? Am lam yunabbah bima fi suhufi Musa wa Ibrahim alladhi wafa? Have you not read what was given to Ibrahim, the scriptures of Ibrahim, Ibrahim, the one who fulfilled, the one who actually." Worked for his akhirah. Walid is trying to pay his way to Jannah. You need to be like Ibrahim. You have to work for your akhirah. You need to put in effort. Wa Ibrahim alladhi wafa. Now, the next ayah, the next several verses, in fact. Where Allah says, These are pieces of, these are verses that are also mentioned in the scriptures of Musa and Ibrahim. So when Allah says, Allah Tazruwaziratun Ukhra. The next few verses are a common theme in the Quran and in previous scriptures. So the next ayah, Allah says, Allah tazir wa ziratun wizra ukhra, that none shall bear the burden of another. Meaning that this teaching, this idea of accountability, that you're accountable for your own actions, that you will not be held, you will not carry the burden of others. This is something that was mentioned even in previous books of Revelation. This is something that Ibrahim taught. This is something that was taught by Musa. 
This is not something that's being newly introduced by the Holy Prophet. But what does it mean when we say that none shall bear the burden of another? This refers primarily to the hereafter. Now, why do I say the hereafter? Meaning on the day of judgment, you're not going to be held responsible for the sins of others. You're not going to pay for the consequence. You're not going to experience the consequence of the sin of others. Now, in this life, brothers and sisters, we have examples of innocent people carrying the burden of others. What do I mean by this? If someone is born out of wedlock, he's innocent. He didn't commit a sin. He's innocent. His parents committed zina, for example. They committed a sin. They will be held accountable for that sin. But that child has to carry a burden. What is that burden? For example, in our fiqh, that child, this person cannot be the imam of jama'ah because one of the conditions of imam al jama'ah is taharatul mawlid. Now you may ask me, but the Quran says, that none shall bear the burden of another. Yes, on the day of judgment. But that doesn't mean that the consequences are not potentially inherited by others. Meaning that you lose out on this on this honor. And perhaps this is meant to instill a hatred towards that sin. That a person who's born out of wedlock and is deprived of the honor of leading jama'ah, the hope will be, number one, this is a public position, and usually the sharia does not want people born out of wedlock to be in public positions, because when you're in a public position, you're naturally going to be scrutinized, and people can be very vicious when they're dealing with public figures. And perhaps people will mention that this person was born out of wedlock. So protect to, so to protect the honor and the integrity of this person, Allah doesn't want them to be in public positions like leading the jama'ah. So he doesn't give them this. He doesn't allow them to assume these positions. But this person is innocent. On the day of judgment, absolutely, none shall bear the burden of another. But we also have to keep in mind that this doesn't mean we have some examples. So this was one example of in this life, you may commit a sin and there may be a burden that has to be carried by your progeny because of, because of you committing Zina, for example. Another exception to this rule where none shall carry, bear the burden of another is mentioned in a hadith from the Holy Prophet that's attributed to the Holy Prophet where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi says, Man sanna sunnatan, man sanna fil islami sunnatan hasan kana lahu ajru wa ajru man amila biha min ba'di if you establish a good practice, a good tradition, you will be rewarded for it, and anyone who follows in your footsteps, you will receive the reward. So for example, imagine in a community, I start a tradition that on Wednesday nights, I gather all of the youth, we play basketball together, and we pray jama'ah together. And it becomes a tradition. If, if you establish something positive like that, you get the reward. And anyone who follows in your footsteps, you're a partner in the thawab. So this is on the positive side. And then the Prophet says, وَمَنْ سَنَّ سُنَّةً سَيِّئَةً فَعَلَيْهِ مِثْلُ وِزْرَ كُلِّ مَنْ عَمِلَ بِهَا إِلَىٰ يَوْمِ الْقِيَامِ But if you establish 
a sinful practice, you will be punished, you will be held accountable, and anyone who follows in your footsteps, you will bear the burden because you introduced this practice. So when we read this ayah, and la tazru wa ziratun wizr ukhra, we have to understand that it has certain exceptions. There are certain exceptions in this life where the burden can be carried by others. If you influence people to commit sin, you are held responsible. So for example, if I start this, if I introduce youth in my community to the sin of gambling, I commit a sin, and anyone who follows in my footsteps, those youth who start gambling because I introduce them to the casinos, anytime they go to the casino and they gamble, I am committing a sin. Even after I die, because I established this sinful practice, I carry the burden of their sins as well, because I influence them to disobey Allah. So these are some of the exceptions, but the general rule is that on the day of judgment, everyone be, will be held accountable for their actions. That you will not carry the burden of others. And then Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَأَلَّيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى The next ayah, that man shall not have but that which he endeavored. So again, this is also something that is mentioned in the scriptures of Musa and Ibrahim. So the previous verse, and la tazuru wa ziratun wizra ukhra, this is found in the suhuf of Musa, the suhuf of Ibrahim. And also the idea that you shall not have anything but that which you endeavored for. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, I may have mentioned this before, but what's unique about the way that Allah assesses our, our value on the Day of Judgment is that Allah Azza wa Jal rewards us and punishes us based on the effort not on the results you know if you if you take an exam you know if you're in college and you take an exam even if i didn't put any effort if i score a high mark on the exam i'm going to get a, get a good grade in the class so your instructors your professors your teachers they typically reward you and grade you based on the results. What's the result of the exam? You came to class, you got all the answers correct, you get an A. So you're graded, you're rewarded based on the results. The teachers usually, generally, they don't care about the effort. At the end of the day, you either pass the exam or you don't. But Allah Azza wa Jal deals with us differently. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cares about the effort because in many cases the results are not in our hands. If I go to the if I use the example of Ibrahim, Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ibrahim and I'll give you give you two examples. Ibrahim alayhi salam had two sons, Ismail and Ishaq. He put in the effort to raise them properly. And he got the desired results. They're righteous. They're prophets. And then you have someone like Yaqub. Yaqub also put in the effort to discipline his children, to guide them. But did he get the same results? Some of his sons tried to kill Yusuf. Is Allah going to punish Yaqub for not being a good father? No. Allah rewards Ya'qub because of his effort in child rearing, even though the results were not favorable. So Allah Azza wa Jal 
rewards us based on effort because if if Allah rewards us based on results there are many prophets who should not receive any thawab if you look at Nuh as I mentioned Nuh after 950 years what what, what, what were the results 80 followers is Allah gonna punish him because is Allah gonna tell him that listen you were preaching for 950 years you only have 80 followers to show for it? Isa alayhi salam, did he get the did he get favorable results? He didn't. There were many prophets who were rejected. There are many prophets who did not fulfill what they had desired to fulfill, to guide their communities. Many prophets failed in guiding their communities. Is Allah gonna punish them? No, because Allah doesn't reward based on results. He's gonna reward all of them because of their effort. He's gonna reward Zakaria. For his effort, Yahya for his effort, Musa for his effort. Musa alayhi salam, after saving Bani Israel, he goes to the mountain, he comes back, they're worshiping a golden calf. Is Allah gonna punish Musa? No, Allah rewards him for his effort. And then Allah says, And that his endeavoring shall be seen so not only will you see your the deeds even the effort the intentions the effort will be seen the quran in many verses highlights this idea that our deeds will materialize on the day of judgment if you have a good intention, if you treat your parents with respect, if you give charity, these are good deeds. But can you, is a good deed something that's tangible? It's not something that's tangible. But on the day of judgment in the Akhirah, these righteous deeds will become tangible. They will materialize. This is known as, in the Ahadith as, this is why Allah, for example, in Surah Ali Imran, ayah number 30, He says, يَوْمَ تَجِدُوا كُلُّ نَفْسٍ مَا عَمِلَتْ مِنْ خَيْرٍ مُحْضَرًا On the day in which every soul shall find what the good that it has done present. It will be there. They will be able they will be able to witness the good that they have done. There's a hadith from the Holy Prophet where he speaks about this idea, this concept of Tajsidul Aman, the materialization of good deeds. Rasulullah says, In al mu'mina idha kharaja min qabri. The believer, the Holy Prophet says, indeed the believer, when he comes out of his grave, his good deeds will take on a form, a beautiful image. And he will say to this image, مَا أَنْتَ فَوَ اللَّهِ إِنِّي لَأَرَاكَ مْرَأَ الصِّدْقِ That what are you? I swear by God, you are a beautiful individual, a beautiful person. It will have the form of an individual or some type of form. So the, the believer will be amazed at the beauty of this image. فَيَقُولْ This image, this thing that is seeable that is witnessed by the believer will say Anna amaluk that I am your deeds I am the materialization of your deeds that this image this form will be a guiding light that will take you to paradise and then the prophet says wa inna صور له عمله في صورة سيئة 
when the disbeliever comes out of his grave, his actions will take on the will take on a form, a very unappealing and a repugnant image. That what are you? You are a most terrible companion. فَيَقُولْ أَنَا عَمَلُكْ I am your deeds. فَيَنْطَلِقُ بِهِ حَتَّى يَدْخُلَ النَّارِ And this image, this form will then drive him to the hellfire. So it's not only our deeds, brothers and sisters, that will be witnessed on the Day of Judgment, it's even the effort. You know, sometimes you might put in effort, but the actual deed doesn't materialize. You put in effort, for example, to build a hospital, to build a school, but you don't achieve the goal. The action doesn't materialize. Allah says even if the action doesn't come to fruition, you will witness the effort. Even the effort will be there. If you make an effort to wake up for Salatul Fajr, you put the alarm, you tell your spouse, you know, please wake me up. If I don't wake up, pour water on my face. And you still don't wake up. Allah will still reward you for what? For the effort. You made a sincere effort to wake up for Salatul Fajr. It didn't happen. You never woke up. But you still receive the reward for the effort. You'll see not just the deeds, but the effort. And then Allah says, Whereupon he will be rewarded for it with the fullest reward. Brothers and sisters, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not shortchange anyone when it comes to rewarding them. You know, sometimes you might do a job and a person might, may not compensate you as you deserve to be compensated. Allah here says that I reward with the fullest reward. I don't shortchange anyone. In fact, Allah is so generous that I'll share with you a hadith from Imam al-Baqir. You know, sometimes, especially on certain holy nights, we perform certain a'mal, certain rituals. We recite certain supplications. We do certain prayers. And then typically you find someone who will ask, you know, is this based on a sahih hadith? Is this an authentic hadith? And because they might not believe that it's authentic, they don't do it. There's a hadith from Imam al-Baqir where he says, مَنْ بَلَغَهُ ثَوَابٌ مِنَ اللَّهِ عَلَىٰ عَمَلٍ If you come across a narration, a hadith, that mentions a specific reward for an action or for a ritual, فَعَمِلَ ذَلِكَ الْعَمَلِ الْتِمَاسَ ذَلِكَ الثَّوَابِ So for example, you come across a hadith that if you do this prayer, you'll receive this reward. Or if you perform this ziyara, you'll receive X amount of hasanat. And you do it in the hopes of receiving this reward from God. Imam al-Baqir says, So this hadith is a sahih hadith that I'm sharing with you. It's an authentic narration. The Imam says, if someone does something, because they heard that they will be rewarded for it. You know, they read a hadith, they hear from a, a reliable scholar that if you do a certain deed, you'll receive this amount of thawab. The imam says they will be rewarded even if that narration turns out to be inaccurate. This is why when it comes to mustahabbat, you know, we don't, we're not obsessed with, you know, whether the hadith is correct or not, because we rely on this authentic narration that says that if you hear about the thawab of a certain action and you do it in hopes of receiving that reward, you will receive it even if this hadith is not accurate, purely because of Allah's mercy and His generosity. So Allah rewards to the fullest.
So, so just to review, brothers and sisters, we mentioned three verses, th four verses where Allah shares with us what was mentioned in the previous scriptures. Allah tazru wa ziratun wizra ukhra, that none shall bear the burden of others. And again, this is a reminder of the fact that we are accountable for our actions. That, you know, this is a refutation of, for example, the doctrine of original sin. Certain sects within Christianity have this belief that we inherited the sin of Adam and Jesus Christ bears the burden of our sins and he was crucified. We have no such concept in, in Islam. Everyone shall bear their own burden. Everyone will be accountable for themselves on the Day of Judgment. And then you have number two, وَأَلَّيْسَ لِلْإِنسَانِ إِلَّا مَا سَعَى That the human being will have nothing except what he strives for, what he endeavors. And this is also a, a refutation of, you know, what was happening in medieval Europe. You know, the Roman Catholic Church, for those of you who studied medieval history, we know that the Roman Catholic Church used to sell indulgences. People would commit sins. They'd come and to basically exonerate themselves, To they would pay money to the church and they would receive a certificate saying that you are now forgiven and you will not be punished for this sin. People have this idea that they can buy their way out of the hellfire. Allah says, you don't have anything except what you strive for. You can't pay your way out of hell, and you cannot pay your way into paradise. And then the verse that we concluded with, ثُمَّ يُجْزَاهُ الْجَزَاءَ الْأَوْفَى That Allah, that human beings will be rewarded to the fullest extent. And I'll, we'll conclude with this hadith from the Holy Prophet وآله, as a reminder of how generous Allah is and how Allah rewards us to the fullest when we do the most simple of actions. There's a hadith where the Holy Prophet says, قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ يَوْمًا لِأَصْحَابِهِ The Holy Prophet once said, one day says to his companions, which one of you fasts every single day? فَقَالَ سَلْمَانْ أَنَا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Salman al-Farisi says, I do, O Messenger of Allah. And then the Prophet asks a second question. فَأَيُّكُمْ يُحْيِي اللَّيْلِ Which one of you stands up for worship the entire night? The Prophet is asking all of his companions, only Salman al-Farisi responds. And he says, Ana ya Rasulullah, I do, O Messenger of Allah. The Prophet then asks, فَأَيُّكُمْ يَخْتِمُ الْقُرْآنَ فِي كُلِّ يَوْمِ Which one of you recites the entire Qur'an every night? Salman al-Farisi says, Ana ya Rasulullah. The Hadith says, فَغَضِبَ بَعْضُ أَصْحَابِ the hadith says that some of the companions became angry and they say to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, Salman rajulul min al -furs. Salman is a Persian and he's trying to boast and brag about his good deeds. Yuridu an yaftakhira alayna. The Prophet tells them to be silent and he says, ask him what he means. Because Salman is like Luqman. Salman is like Luqman al-Hakim. Luqman, the one who's mentioned in the Quran. He's as wise as Luqman. So ask him what he means when he says, I, I fast every day, I pray all night, and I recite the Quran every day. So one of the men asks Salman, he says, Oh Salman, how could you say that you fast every day when I see most afternoons you're eating? Many times I see you eating during the day. How can you claim to fast every day? Salman 
Radhwanullah ta'ala alayhi says, Inni asumu thalafata fi shah. I fast three days every month. And Allah in the Quran says, Man ja'a bil hasana falahu ashru amthaliha. Whoever brings a good deed, it will be multiplied by ten. I fast for three days, Allah multiplies it by ten, and it becomes thirty days. So it's as though I have fasted the entire month, and therefore I fast year-round. Then the man asks, how could you claim to stand for worship all night? When I see that most of the night you're asleep, I know that most of the night you're asleep. Salman says, سَمَعْتُ حَبِيبِ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وآله. I heard my beloved Rasulullah say, مَنْ بَاتَ عَلَىٰ طُهْرٍ فَكَأَنَّهُ أَحْيَ اللَّيْلَ كُلَّ فَأَنَا أَبِيتُ عَلَىٰ طُهْرٍ I heard my beloved, the Messenger of Allah say, whoever goes to sleep in a state of wudu, in a state of tahara, it's as though they have spent the entire night in worship. And therefore, every night, I go to sleep in a state of spiritual purity. And then the man says to Salman that how can you claim to recite the entire Qur'an every day? I see that you're silent most of the day, that you're not reciting. Salman again says, I heard my beloved, the Messenger of Allah, say, to Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib, Ya Abu al Hassan. So he says, I was with Amir al muminin and Rasulullah one day, and the Prophet was saying to Ali ibn Abi Talib, Ya Abu al Hassan, مثل, The example of you in my nation, in my community, You're like Surah Qul Huwa Allahu Ahad, O Ali. فَمَنْ قَرَأَهَا مَرَّةً قَرَأَ ثُلُثَ الْقُرْآنِ Whoever recites قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدُ once, it's as though they have recited a third of the Qur'an. وَمَنْ قَرَأَهَا مَرَّتَيْنِ فَقَدْ قَرَأَ ثُلُثَيْ الْقُرْآنِ Whoever recites قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَد twice, it's as though they have recited two-thirds of the Qur'an. وَمَنْ قَرَأَهَا ثَلَاثًا فَقَدْ خَتَمَ الْقُرْآنِ Whoever recites it three times, it's as though they have recited the entire Qur'an. Ya Ali, Salman, he says, then the Prophet says to Ali, Ya Ali, فَمَنْ أَحَبَّكَ بِلِسَانِهِ فَقَدْ أَكْمَلَ لَهُ ثُلُثَ الْإِيمَانِ Whoever loves you with his tongue, O Ali, he has completed one-third of his faith. وَمَنْ أَحَبَّكَ بِلِسَانِهِ وَقَلْبِهِ فَقَدْ كَمُلَ لَهُ ثُلُثَ الْإِيمَانِ Whoever loves you with his tongue and with his heart, he has completed two-thirds of his faith. وَمَنْ أَحَبَّكَ بِلِسَانِهِ وَقَلْبِهِ وَنَصَرَهُ بِيَدِهِ فَقَدْ اسْتَكْمَلَ الْإِيمَانِ Whoever loves you with his tongue and with his heart, and supports you with his hands, who actively supports you, he has completed his faith. So you see, brothers and sisters, we offer very little. We do things that are so insignificant, yet Allah rewards us so generously. And this is what Allah means when he says, ثُمَّ يُجْزَاهُ الْجَزَاءَ الْأَوْفَى Whereupon he will be rewarded for it with the fullest Reward. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to get to guide us and bless us and illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi al